ensure uh, tapping up the dissection clock as much as possible. So three, three stents were deployed, post dilated, and the final item showed good stent acquisition and expansion with no edge dissection. And then finally, if you don't have 60 seconds, if the patient is really unstable and cannot refuse, all, all, you just have to act right away and then think about the personal causes afterwards. So managing catastrophes in the cath lab, it's not just let's start cutting and see what happens, right? Go through this systematically. So my take home, take home point is that when you do have an unexpected uh, hemodynamic collapse, you want to rapidly first make sure if it's real. Because if it's not real, I have seen people give epinephrine or um, a, a ton of neo um, in a patient who, who just the pressure gauge was off or there was an air bubble and the next thing you know, the pressure's sky high, the, the patient's bleeding into their brain. So that's not what you want to do. You want to make sure it's real. And then go through the checklist systematically. Bleeding, ischemia, rhythm, cardiac reserve, and breathing. And breathing. Look for reversal and support your blood pressure rate, rhythm, oxygenation, and ventilation as needed. The biggest thing and the most important thing is to just stay calm and to use closed communication to reduce confusion. So my team knows that if I say, give Neo, the nurse who's giving the Neo has to say 100 of Neo given. That's the only way we're going to know that it actually was given, that it was heard, and, and things are moving accordingly. Um, because sometimes people in the, in the chaos, people will not hear what you're saying. And so you want low, closed loop communication. The other thing that I stress on doing is that you're not going to be able to manage everything yourself. So sometimes I'll just put the fellow on hemodynamics and medications. They are in charge of monitoring the hemodynamics, monitoring the patient's pain, and giving whatever it is the patient needs. It has to be fentanyl, um, uh, neo, atropine, while I'm working on the coronary. Because you just you can't split your mind in two ways. You can't, don't try to multitask. You just try to. Try to give each team member uh, their point place where they should be focused on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Now the floor is open for any question and queries. Yes, Tampanog would definitely be one to think about. Um, yeah, so uh, for me that sort of fits in with perforation, but 100% agree. Tampanog is, is, a, is a key thing and that you do want to double check uh, with focus um, uh, that you haven't developed in a future. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, all, all our extreme cases, uh, apart from the last case, on which they beat the road up and afterwards there is no flow to the LAD, yeah? So one case, after rotoplation, there was no flow in the LED patient collapse. So what might be the region? Is it the acupuncture syndrome or air embolism that might be happens just after doing rota when we supposed to give the nitro intercolor? Yeah, so that was a tough case, and I'm still not 100% sure what happened, but what I think may have happened, and this can only be a guess, what I think may have happened is when we were pulling the pressure catheter back, um, that it might, we had some trouble bringing it back. And I wonder if we disrupted some plaque at that point. And that, that then at that point, the rotational endorectomy was made at worse. Um, so we have the luxury of hemodynamic uh, support device access for these chiropractors and how they go here. What is your major decision maker in the setting of hemodynamic collapse where you're like, this is not going to turn around? I'm going to need to put this on person, put this person on to support to unload this heart, whether it's in a pill or or whatever. What are the sort of clinical features, timing features, ideologic factors that you use to say we're not going to turn this around now? Yeah, so to me it depends on what the ideology is and what, um, how quickly we can reverse it. So in cases where I can restore flow easily, I expect things to turn around quickly to get home. And I don't expect there to be a need for long term support. Now, that being said, if there could be a lack of flow and you can't deliver equipment there properly, so I've been in a situation where things are occluded and I can't get a balloon down or I can't get um, uh, the equipment down. And rather than messing around with the corners to try to get the, the balloon down, I'll go for a much more potent uh, support and call the ECMO team in uh, 
uh, in case they're needed, or like with the mechanical, system, um, mechanical injuries, uh, mechanical complications that we keep in mind, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring in um, an ECMO team as well. Uh, but uh, I have no problems calling both for advanced uh, support like ECMO and a surgeon uh, in the control room. And if they have to hang out for a little bit, that is fine. That is totally fine. At least they're ready to go if I need them. But if, if we're able to turn things around relatively quickly, then um, then I'm unlikely to need you know some of the more advanced. Yeah, I, love, I love the collaborative mindset there. Like get them, get the bodies here because they're at minimum going to be helpful with hands for CPR. But yeah, and they'll hang out in the control room yeah. and they'll just watch and they'll wait for me to say, okay, you're okay, we're yeah. going to go now. And, and do you, what do you think about sort of early hemodynamic assessment? Do you put a fairly short, low threshold for a right heart cath in the mind? Extremely, extremely low threshold for a right heart cath, for sure. Um, I, I honestly, in, in every shock case, you know, for the, for the most part, if I'm thinking the chemical support, I'm putting in a right heart cath to define which one. And, and that's really because sometimes I think we overuse it, right? Sometimes we think the patient's in trouble, but they're actually going to be fine. And, and you, you get some hemodynamics and you realize that the filling pressures are okay, the cardiac index is just borderline, all I need to do is restore flow, and the contractile reserve is going to come back. And there are other times when we think, oh, this patient is in shock, needs an impella, and the hemodynamics are so bad, the filling pressures are so high, the cardiac index is so low that, that we're underusing, and is not going to be enough. You really need ecto in place. So, uh, you know, I, I, do, I do have a very low threshold now for right heart cath and So we mostly depend on the anotherms. We use norepinaline, the vitamin we're coming in. So our problem we face that we go to the escalate the dose and to increase the maximum dose, but we face the failure. So now this, uh, our anesthetic colleague, they are saying we can use basopressin. So what is your comment about this? What, what additional drugs we can use? You mentioned about Neo something that we are not familiar with. Which one is it, Neo? In your one of the cases. Okay. Uh, uh, microcatheter support, but um, 
So, so I'll do seven French interventions regularly. It doesn't necessarily change the way um, I would approach the patient. Uh, but yeah, I, I luckily with the equipment these days, for the most part, we can handle these things with a six through a six French guide. But I would never fault someone for going to a seven French guide first. Dr. Chan of Dr. Arun Master. He is from Nepal, but he is the alumni of Bangladesh, especially Kitabong Medical College, my medical school. Right now, in the dais, out of five, three from Kitabong Medical College. Thank you, Dr. Hakim Thank you, Sky. Uh, Dr. Chairperson and panelists, going back from complex PCI, left pain, and other things now, I'm going to change my topic to. Organist coronary dissections. <laughs>